Well, the Yukon Huskies are locked into a great seat in March, but how many other teams from the wild, wild Big East are going to go dancing this year? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up? Welcome to the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Andy Patton, and I am thrilled to be joined today by Matt St. Jean of Road to the Garden. Matt covers the Big East, and Matt, it is almost the new year. We're just about to get into January here. Of course, conference play is kind of finally getting all the way underway here. Uh, and I want to talk about March. I know that it's still 2022, haven't quite got to the new year yet. But of course, uh, the Big East, as usual, is just full of surprises. There's teams uh, on the way up, teams on the way down, kind of unexpected results. It seems like that's always kind of the case. Uh, I just finished Dana O'Neill's incredible book about the Big East. So the history mm-hmm. indicates that things are always a little bit crazy in the conference. Uh, but really, I want to kind of start the conversation today just talking about what the NCAA tournament picture kind of looks like for this conference right now, which teams feel like they're fairly safely in the field and maybe which teams uh, still have some work to do if they want to be dancing in March. Yeah. I mean, the team right off the top that everybody's going to be talking about is UConn. Um, I think at this point, it's not whether they're going to make the tournament. The question is how far do they go? It's are they a second weekend team, third weekend team, championship team. I think anything short of a second weekend there, it would be a disappointment at this Mm -hmm. point. You look down the rest of the conference right now, if you look at the net, there would mm-hmm. be four bids from the Big yeah. East. So that'd be UConn at the top plus Xavier, which is currently mm-hmm. ranked Marquette, which was just ranked. Yeah. Um, and Creighton. Creighton yeah. is still in there. Uh, Joe Lunardi's bracket today had them as one of the last teams in, which in my eyes is too low. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a Creighton team, they've been disappointing, I think. And we're going to talk mm-hmm. about that. I know in a little bit, but also, mm-hmm. No real bad losses, yeah. no terrible losses on the resume. And the only losses you can argue were bad were with a starting caliber player, an all-conference caliber player mm-hmm. there, sick. Yeah. So all their losses are close, and they're all basically all away from home. So this is a Creighton team that I think will bounce back, and they're going to be in the tournament for sure. Mm-hmm. Then you look at the next group of teams. I think it's four for sure. Mm-hmm. The next group is what's going to determine how many are in from the Big East. Mm-hmm. Butler is the next team in the net. They've mm-hmm. been really up and down. Um, they've had Ali Ali and Jalen Thomas, two transfers that came in who only came back two games ago. And those should be somewhat impact players for them. You've got Providence, which is undefeated in December so far. You've right. got Villanova, also undefeated in December at this point, and that's with the return of Cam Whitmore. Justin Moore is going to be back for them down the line. You've got St. John's, which has a lot of wins right yeah. now, but no quality ones. And Seton Hall, which is kind of quietly hanging around there with some quality wins on the resume. They have a bad loss to Siena, but they have a couple wins. And yeah. they're a well-coached team. They've started off the Big East in an interesting spot. And actually, as of, record- as of us recording this tonight, mm-hmm. They play at Marquette yeah. in what I think is a very interesting game. If that's a game, Seton Hall, if they find a way to win that game, I think you really have to talk about them as a team that could make a run and get into the tournament conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I was, I was, I was going to mention that, that we're recording this before the Seton Hall-Marquette game. And if you know if Marquette wins that one or if they win it pretty handily, uh, it looks much better for them. It looks worse for Shaheen Holloway and Seton Hall. But if Seton Hall pulls off a victory here, which I, I don't think it's crazy to think that they could. I, obviously, we've seen this team there an elite defensive program and Marquette has been a little inconsistent when they're on. They're really, really good. Uh, But I think that could be a game that, that could be pretty interesting. And for people listening, the result has already happened. If Seton Hall wins that game, then yeah, I I agree. They could be really interesting. And it kind of leads into the next thing that I I sort of wanted to talk about here, which is like, if there are teams that you think could, could maybe even steal a bid, the Big East tournament is always just just a, a wild one. And, and I'm wondering if there are some teams you think that maybe they could they move up a little bit in the standings, but maybe they they could be uh, – UConn's going to be tough to beat at any point at, at this year. But uh, are there t- chances for, for the conference to maybe steal a bid and get another team in there? So if we're talking about teams that are going to have to steal a bid in March, first that's Georgetown and DePaul at the bottom sure. of the conference. Georgetown I don't think is capable of it. Right. DePaul is a question mark. 
because mm-hmm. of how injured the team is. Yeah. Caleb Murphy was one of their top transfers coming in. He still has not played. I think he just came back to practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yorane just came back for the first time since the game against Minnesota, which was the team's third game of the year. Mm-hmm. And Nick Ongenda, who's a very good center for them, has not played the season. He's going to be out for a while. This team will look different when they're yeah. back. I don't know how good it is. Yeah. So if we look at the rest of the conference, if I'm looking for a team that's going to do well in the Big East tournament, I look at teams that play a unique style, teams right. that are deep, teams that can win three or four games in three or four days. Marquette, I think, is at the top of that because of what Shaka Smart does. Yep. I look at Seton Hall because mm-hmm. it's an experienced team. It's a deep team. There's a lot of guys that play. They're a New York area team. They should be able to get some fans there. And If they get going and get hot, I think they can mm-hmm. play with anybody in the Big East. Seton Hall is a team to watch there. And then I'm going to go with Providence and Villanova. Yeah. Villanova is very talented. Yeah. And I think going to become a better team. They'll be a different, they'll get Justin Moore back. They're going to have Cam Whitmore developed by the end of the year. And Providence is arguably the best coached team in the conference right now with Ed Cooley there and what he's done consistently. And it's a team that always does well in the Big East tournament. They won the first one in the new Big East. They've gotten there before when they had teams that got hot at the right time. It's a talented team. That's one I think could absolutely make noise. And, they could go from being off the bubble, from being outside looking in to in the tournament, or they could go from being a play in game to a seven seed by right. winning a couple games there. Absolutely. It's funny to mention Villanova is like a, a bid stealing team, but like yeah. the end of the season, if Big East wins the, or if Villanova wins the Big East tournament, I think a lot of people who maybe don't pay attention to college basketball will be like, yeah, of course. But it seems yeah. like it's going to be a little more of a wild ride to potentially get there. But uh, obviously, with their health coming around, yeah. uh, that's a really good sign for them. Uh, well, you wanna- gotta- Go ahead. I think there's one other team to mention there too, which is St. John's. Mm-hmm. MSG is their other home building. Yeah. And they play that fast paced style. They almost knocked off Villanova last year. Uh, they ended yeah. up blowing a 17 point lead there. And they just blew another lead to Villanova last week. So, well, um, UConn has been one of the most surprising teams in all of college basketball this season. But who else has surprised in the Big East and maybe who has failed to meet expectations? Before we get into that, though, today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Bet Online. College basketball and the NBA are back in action. College football bowl season is underway. And of course, the NFL playoffs are approaching. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information from all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. BetOnline remains the best spot for all the latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all of the leagues this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. They even have lines for coaching changes across every major sport, so even in the offseason, you can get your fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, segment two here, Locked On College Basketball Podcast. I want to thank all of you for making this podcast your first listen of the day. And for those of you who checked out Monday's episode of the Locked On Sports Today podcast, reviewing the year of 2022, you should continue to make Locked On Sports Today your second listen of the day. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, Matt, we're sticking Big East, and we want to talk here about some of the surprise teams in the conference, some of the teams that maybe haven't quite met their expectations so far. Uh, Before we get into surprise teams, though, we got to start with UConn. It's obviously one of the biggest stories of the season. They were a team that wasn't expected to be, you know, tops of the Big East, wasn't expected to be a top 20 team, top 15 team. Of course, now here we're looking at them uh, as a top five team in the country. Many places, including myself, have them ranked as the number one team in the country. Uh, I kind of just want to get your sense of like, was this a team that was, was there a reason that this team was undervalued coming into the year? Have they just massively exceeded expectations? I'm kind of curious, just your, your, thoughts on the pulse of this team and maybe what has caused this team to be where they are at this point in the season? I think it's a a combination of multiple factors here. So they were picked fourth in the Big East Mm -hmm. preseason poll, which, and and I think most notably, they were the first team in the poll to not Mm -hmm. have any first place votes, which was the thing that shocked me. Xavier Mm -hmm. got first place votes, UConn didn't. And that was a a big surprise to me. Mm -hmm. And Villanova also. Mm -hmm. And I think the reasoning for that is that Villanova is that top tier program and everybody, even with a new coach, everybody assumed they have talent. They're going to be around the top of the conference. Right. Creighton 
had a lot of players coming back. Sure. And it was easy to project them at the top. Although I will suggest um, Three Man Weaves' Jim Root has a really good article talking yeah. about from the preseason talking about will Creighton actually take a leap this year. And I think it's been very accurate to the Creighton team that we've seen on the court thus far. So mm-hmm. I check that out. And then Zafir had the new coach coming in. And it was a mm-hmm. team that people liked on paper last year. They had a run at the end of the year and had some transfers coming in. People liked. So these were all trendy picks. Mm-hmm. Why UConn wasn't a trendy pick. I don't understand. <laughs> I had them as kind of I'm back and forth between UConn and Villanova as the team that I thought would be number one. I thought Creighton was going to be number two. And mm-hmm. one of one of Villanova or UConn was going to impress and end up winning the conference. And yeah, it's been uh, the emergence for UConn. Is, it's really been about the depth. I think mm-hmm. the top guys have been as good as we expected. Donovan Klingon, who we're going to yeah. talk about later, is mm-hmm. fantastic. Yeah. Alex Caravan is fantastic. These are kind of all-conference caliber players in their first year there. Mm-hmm. And Joey Calcaterra, who they got from uh, out in California. Yeah, San Diego. <laughs> yeah, he has been fantastic mm-hmm. for them. So every move they've made hit. Um, and I think what Dan Hurley that has done there is really interesting. They yeah. lost a lot of people from that roster last year. Mm-hmm. because I think they wanted to. They knew these guys weren't fits. We're going to go. We're going to go get veterans. We're going to get guys that fit what we want to do, and we're going to adjust to the, where this team has failed in the past. And they did all that, and it has worked out perfectly. Every move that Dan Hurley made this offseason has worked. Yeah, it's 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 tough to hit a 1,000, especially when you, you're in the era of not just recruiting high schoolers but also transfer portal additions. Like, you look at the teams that are consistently towards the top, they they bat pretty close. You know, I'm obviously a Gonzaga person. I've talked about that on the show before. And, like, they do a really good job, but they don't always bat a 1,000. And, and even in every offseason, there's something that doesn't quite work most of the time. And for UConn to, to have done that and be in the spot that they're in, I mean, obviously there's still a lot of season left, but, like, they I mean, they beat the tar out of most of the teams that they've played. They haven't had a single digit win in a really like they were ten plus point victories for the first. I don't remember exactly how many all games. of all of non conference play. Every non conference game has been a ten plus point victory. I think I think still every win for them has been yeah. double digits. That was just, both of the wins they smoked Butler and yeah. they beat Georgetown by eleven. So yeah, yeah. they have not had a game decided by less than ten points yet. That is absolutely wild. Well, Matt, I want to kind of talk about some other potentially surprise teams. And I think the Big East, the conversation around the Big East nationally is UConn's really good. And then there's a couple teams that have disappointed. And we're going to talk about those teams in a second. Mm-hmm. But what are some other teams that have maybe been surprising? You mentioned that Xavier got some first place votes uh, in the preseason. So I'm not sure if it's that surprising uh, what they have done under Sean Miller. But I kind of wanted to maybe mention that team or if there's other teams that you think ha- have have exceeded expectations this year. A team that stands out to me is Marquette. This is the second year in a row they were picked to finish ninth in the preseason poll. Uh, They didn't bring in a whole lot of huge names, but it's Mm -hmm. all internal development for what they've done to be a a ranked team and to be a tough, tough game no matter what. Obviously, we talked about they played tonight as Mm -hmm. us recording this, so we'll see what happens there. But Mm -hmm. their other losses this year, they don't have a bad loss. Yeah, It's a double overtime loss at Providence Mm -hmm. and three non-conference losses all Mm -hmm. By close margins to good teams yeah what they've done is fantastic uh briefly a quick story here i got mm-hmm. to talk to some of the players at media day mm-hmm. and their booth was set up right next to the board that had the rankings <laughs> um and i so i wrote up a little story about this mm-hmm. but i just while i was talking to one of the players the other two players were talking to themselves and i was like mm-hmm. oh like what are you guys talking about they're pointing at the board i was like what do you guys think about being picked <laughs> ninth i just kind of asked it to the group and tyler kolek their point guard he yeah. just looks at me and he goes f them <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, and they've lived up to that this year yeah. um, and you mentioned Xavier too they've mm-hmm. been surprising I think the big surprise for them is Sule Boom being as yeah. good as he's been he's mm-hmm. third in the conference in scoring right now he's hitting over 50% of his three point shots on high mm-hmm. volume he's just been incredible for them and everything they could have hoped for in that offense which is one of the best offenses in all of college basketball so far this year yeah, apparently the Big East needs to keep poaching WCC talent. I know Bone started at San Francisco before he ended up uh, – he went somewhere else before he went to Xavier. I can't UTEP. remember. UTEP, it's, that's right. A, a fun thing for you, San Francisco, yeah. there's the Dons out there, yeah. and the building he played in at UTEP is called the Don. <laughs> that must have been really confusing when you got to Xavier and there wasn't any Don-related no. <laughs> stuff. Yeah, I, I, I had to throw that into an article over the summer saying now he's going to Don the blue and gold, the blue and silver. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, let's let's kind of flip the coin a little bit, Matt, and, and kind of talk about some of the teams that, that have been a little disappointing. And I think the first two teams that come up are Villanova and Creighton. And, and you kind of alluded to, to both these programs a little bit. And obviously Nova uh, was missing Cam Whitmore, is still missing Justin Moore. And Creighton was missing Calc Brenner in the game against BYU. 
BYU, and he was out for, I think, three games, at least two games mm -hmm. that he missed. Um, I'm kind of curious, looking at those two teams, which team do you think is more likely to kind of turn things around and end up being kind of maybe back in that top two or three conversation uh, in the Big East? Well, I think it depends on how we're looking at turning things around. I think if you look at Creighton, what's really interesting is this team basically has not moved in the computer rankings all mm -hmm. season long. Mm -hmm. They are right back where they started in Ken Palm. They have, yeah. they have gotten as high as 19 and as low as 29. They're just kind of sitting in that range. Yeah. So they haven't met the human expectations, right. but they have been right par for the course for what the computers thought they True. would be. Yeah. So I, I think they're going to stay in that range. This is mm -hmm. probably going to be, it should be a top 25 team to me by the end of the year. And they'll probably mm -hmm. just hang around there. And by the end of the year, we're just going to forget the blip that happened where right. they lost some close, they lost to Arizona and Texas back to back. Mm -hmm. Neither of those, the both five points or less. Neither of those are bad. They lost to BYU where Kalk Brenner played through illness. Then they lost oh, three right. games in a row with Kalk Brenner out. And they right. lost a road game to Marquette in conference play. Not all of those losses are perfectly explainable when you get to March. Yep. Villanova, on the other hand, I think is a team that can bounce back and get better when Justin mm -hmm. Moore comes back. But I think there are serious problems there uh, defensively. This team's outside of the top 100 in Ken mm -hmm. Palm defensive efficiency, which is the first time they've done that in a decade. The mm -hmm. last time they did it was the last time Jay Wright missed the tournament, if we're not including 2020 in there. Mm -hmm. They need to fix that defense. I don't know if Justin Moore is going to do it. I think mm -hmm. Cam Whitmore helps the defense, but uh, they should be a tournament team. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is I, – I, Creighton can still compete for the Big East Championship. I don't think Villanova is going to do that. Gotcha. Uh, let's talk about a couple other teams. Uh, I'm curious if your other teams, based on your preseason expectations and kind of seeing seeing how the Big East has played out. I, you know, again, uh, Villanova, Creighton, UConn have gotten a ton, a ton of attention. Uh, but are there other teams that maybe have have not quite met your expectations uh, this season? Well, it has to be Georgetown and DePaul still yeah. because. Over the off season, both of these teams seem to be trending in the right direction. They hit the right. transfer portal well, and I mean DePaul, I can excuse a little bit because they lost David Jones to an in conference transfer because he just mm. wanted to play with one of his friends on St. John's. Uh, right. Nothing they can do about that. The rest of what they did in the off season, I liked. What Georgetown mm. did in the off season, other than keeping Patrick Ewing, I liked. Both right. of these teams have gotten worse this year. Georgetown is horrendous. These teams yeah. are outside the top one fifty of the net. Talent wise, both of these teams have an argument to be in the top 125 top 100 and Ken Palm efficiency too like these teams should be at the bottom of the big east mm -hmm. but competitive teams and right. they have not been this season DePaul got killed by Northwestern yeah. Georgetown has three losses in quadrants three and four this mm -hmm. is just the expectations weren't high and they still neither of these teams has met it yeah, it's rough when you can't even uh, meet pretty low expectations uh, in a conference where, yeah, you, you don't like seeing teams at the bottom that are just not competitive. So hopefully those two programs can kind of turn this stuff around. Yeah. Well, I want to talk, uh, I want to switch to talking more about players in the Big East as opposed to just individual teams, uh, kind of taking a look at uh, where we're at in the season, halfway ish point of the season, or at least the new year, which is a nice kind of barometer to kind of take a look back and see who are the, the potential Big East first team guys, the players, the year candidates, uh, mm -hmm. freshman of the year, transfers of the year, kind of all that, all those superlatives that we can give out at this point in the season. So I want to start talking about player of the year. One thing that I find interesting when looking at that race in the Big East is uh, UConn in, in so, is obviously the team to beat. And usually like best player, best team is kind of the way that uh, you start the conversation when you're looking at player of the year. But one of the things that UConn has going for them is a lot of balance. And, you know, Adama Sanogo obviously is, is is who you would consider the best player on that team. But uh, because of their balance, do you think that the player of the year is still going to come from this team? Do you think that Sonogo is kind of that guy? Are there other players that you kind of think are, are in that conversation? Sonogo was the best guy, according to the computers. Right mm -hmm. now, he was preseason, and I think he's got a little bit of momentum there, too. Yeah. Because he was the pick coming in, yeah. you kind of have to knock him off the throne. And he's been fantastic. This yeah. guy's the – he's – one of the hardest to defend post players mm -hmm. in all of college basketball. And he mm -hmm. added a three point shot this year, which I yeah. feels incredibly unfair. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you're supposed to do against that. Yeah. He's been amazing and he's a big part of UConn's success. He makes life easier for everybody else on that team. And, uh, and even over the off season, Dan Hurley mentioned that they were changing the strategy basically around what Snogo could do. They wanted mm -hmm. four guards on the floor with them because he can handle everything in the post. And that makes 
just make what you can do on offense a lot easier. So yeah. he has a huge impact there. The other guy is Ryan Kalkbrenner there. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because of how Creighton looked when he was out. And you yeah. realize how important he is. Creighton's not a tournament team, I don't think, if he is not out there. And they are a team that can compete for the Big East Championship when he is in there. Yeah, so I, if you're looking at it like that, Kalkbrenner has as good of an argument as anybody in the conference. Yeah, Kalkbrenner, he's shooting 75% from the field this year. Like, yeah, yeah, he had a, a run earlier this year where he made 20-something consecutive two-pointers. <laughs> absolutely ridiculous i'm curious yeah. if there's other guys that you kind of think like if we're rounding out an all big east team i call brenner and sonogo i think are my my kind of picks there as well um but if there's other players that maybe are, are in that conversation you kind of look around the the scoring in the big east and scoring is certainly not everything but there's a lot of guys kind of right in the like 15 to 17 points per game range uh you mentioned Sally bomb a minute ago and he's kind of been one of the best scorers in the conference as well are there other guys that you kind of think like if you were rounding out an all Big East team alongside the two bigs in Sonogo and Kalkbrenner that you might that might kind of consider for that roster spot? I, I want to start at the wing here for yeah. who you'd put there. You mentioned Sule Boom. And I know you wanted me to look at most the, the best transfer into the conference. Yeah. Well, when, when you're looking at wing, there's three of them who yeah. are all competing for that. And that's – well, there's Sule Boom who mm-hmm. can do stuff at the, at the guard, but he kind of plays shooting guard. He's almost a wing of what he does. Mm-hmm. Then uh, there's uh, – Bryce Hopkins, yeah. who's been fantastic. He just had a 2020 game. He's had Real. career highs in three of his last four games now. Mm-hmm. So he's, for Providence, he's turned that team around single-handedly. Yeah. Baylor Shireman has still been fantastic for Creighton. He's known as a shooter, but he's a really complete basketball player in what yeah. he does. And then if we're looking at the wing, I'm going back to Xavier with Colby Jones. Yeah, He is one of, I think, eight players in all of college basketball right now who averages more than 10 points, more than five assists, and more than five rebounds per game. He does it all, and he shoots like 44% from deep. So he's just a do-it-all player. I, th- I think those are all guys who would be on that team. Mm-hmm. I'm going to add Tyler Kolick for yeah. what he does with the ball in his hands and the way he sets up guys. Um, it's a really interesting year for guard in the Big East. It's become a very big, dominated conference yeah. right now. And there's a lot of guys who I think can get into the guard conversation, but I don't think we know for sure yet. Pasha Alexander's in there. Andre Carpello's in there. Primo mm-hmm. Spears for Georgetown has actually been fantastic yeah. there. He's been a, a bright spot on that team. Ryan Nemhart at Creighton is really good. UConn has a whole bunch of guards. I don't know if any of them are good enough to actually get all conference awards. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a lot going around all around the conference there. And I, that'll be an interesting dynamic to see how that part plays out. Absolutely. Well, you, you mentioned uh, freshman of the year. We talked a little bit about how we were going to do freshman of the year. Uh, and that's the, the preseason pick was Cam Whitmore. He's the obvious choice. Like you said, you kind of have to unseat mm-hmm. the guy who's at the top of the list. Uh, but Whitmore obviously started the year out hurt. Uh, he's back. He's played five games. He's only played about 22 minutes per game. So conceivably, he's going to kind of get his feet under him and, and continue to improve. And, and what we've seen from him in those five games has been pretty solid. I mean, you can see the appeal of why mm-hmm. this kid was a top five potential pick in the 2023 NBA draft. Uh, we've also seen a handful of other freshmen really step up in a big way in the Big East. Um, is Whitmore still the 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 pick here and if if it's somebody else who do you think might be in that conversation well i think the conversation right now is down to four players and they Mm -hmm. play on two teams it's donovan Klingon and alex carabin at uconn and cam whitmore and mark armstrong at villanova Klingon is kind of running away with it at the moment he's the leader right now uh ken palm says he's the third best player in the conference there's There's a world here where the player of the year and the freshman of the year come from the same team and play the same position with Sonogo and Klingon. Yeah, which I don't know if that has ever happened before in a power conference. Uh, I'll have to do a little research on that one. He's been fantastic. Whitmore's been really good. Mm -hmm. I think Armstrong and Caravan are on the outside looking in, but Mm -hmm. what they can do is really interesting, and we'll see how they develop. It's it's crazy to say that it's Klingon's award to lose right now because right. I feel like Whitmore has so much ground to make up. Klingon mm-hmm. won tournament MVP already for PK85 there for yeah. UConn, and he did that before Whitmore had even stepped on the court. Yeah. Pretty big advantage you get when you're able to do that. Um, yeah. You mentioned transfer of the year. We already kind of talked about a handful of those guys, but I'm curious uh, looking at that. I know it's not an official award, or at least I don't think no. that he says it as an official award. We'll oh, see we if don't. it starts to become adopted as the transfer portal uh, becomes such a, an integral part of how teams are, are building their rosters. But uh, you mentioned Boehm, you mentioned Shireman. Are those kind of the two top guys there? And, and Hopkins, you mentioned him as well. Um, are there other guys uh, who kind of maybe step up as, as potential transfer additions uh, in the, in the big 
East? Potential. I think it, it has to be those three right now yeah. because of the roles that play other teams too. And because the three teams are good, that's going to be part of it. There are other guys who have come into the conference and played well, mm-hmm. but they like it's there's a couple guys like Primo Spears for Georgetown, who's the second leading scorer in the conference right now, but he's just mm-hmm. not going to be in the conversation for that award because of what else mm-hmm. is going on. I think Andre Corbello could potentially be in that conversation from St. John's. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we include David Jones in this and intra conference transfer there right. from DePaul to St. John's. Yeah. He's also played well. So if we're including him in the conversation, he should be in it. But mm-hmm. these are all guys who are on the second tier there. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that should be. The only one I had really on my notes is, is Tristan Newton at UConn. Yeah. And yeah. I like him a lot, but they also, I mean, it's him, Hassan Diara and yeah. um, the other guard whose name I'm forgetting number four. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nahim Aline from Virginia Tech, who right. all play well, and I don't think any of them are dominant enough to make a more convincing argument than Sule Boom, who's going to be the best guard transfer right now. Yeah, absolutely. With you 100% on that list. Well, Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to come on to the show, man. Uh, I appreciate it. It's always fun to talk Big East basketball, always fun to kind of get a look at this uh, really fun conference uh, that has been kind of dominated by one team, but that has so much intrigue uh, going into uh, the, the next part of the season and really getting into conference play. So I appreciate you taking the time. Always fun to come on. All right. Well, that's going to do us do it for us today. Check out the show wherever you get podcasts. Go subscribe on YouTube. If you haven't done so yet, go to YouTube.com. Search Locked On College Basketball. Hit that big red subscribe button. More fun content coming later this week. For now, peace out.